Did you know that for 17 years, the moon was in Florida? Orlando, specifically. No, not some gaudy, moon-inspired tourist attraction. The actual moon. The one you look up at every night. You could argue that such a cosmic jaunt would have been noticed at some point, and you'd be right. But this story is less about celestial mechanics than about borders. And borders need not make sense. Borders, in this case, was Bishop William D. Borders, of the Diocese of Orlando, who, in 1969, met with Pope Paul VI for his Ad Limina, a bidecadal chat in which bishops networked with the various Vatican higher-ups. While chatting with his boss, he made the somewhat presumptuous claim that he was, quote, Bishop of the Moon, and, upon seeing Paul's expression, clarified that, under the 1917 Code of Canon Law, any newly discovered territory falls under the jurisdiction of the diocese in which the expedition originated. It was a flag of convenience dating from the European Age of Discovery, allowing priests to get on with saving heathen souls without having to go through the bother of building anything as permanent as a town. Since the moon landing originated in Cape Canaveral, and since Cape Canaveral fell under the Diocese of Orlando, that meant that the moon was now part of the Diocese of Orlando. There is no evidence that Paul took this news to heart, and in 1983, John Paul II scrapped that rule and granted that jurisdictional power solely to the Pope. Although the moon, despite the occasional internet claim, is no longer in Florida, the underlying gravity, if you will, of this charming story was highlighted in June 1969 when Buzz Aldrin, an ordained Presbyterian elder, took communion in the lunar excursion module before stepping onto the lunar surface. He had obtained special dispensation to perform the communion himself, but should we establish a more permanent presence on the moon, under whose auspices could a communion be performed? More broadly, what exactly should we do with the moon? According to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, the moon is the province of all mankind. It even says so on that plaque the astronauts left behind. A noble sentiment, but let's get real. Once we start profiting from the moon, visions of the collective good of the human species will go the way of the League of Nations. If the Artemis program is anything more than an expensive showpiece, and I have yet to be convinced that it is, it must pave the way toward private exploitation and colonization of the moon. And to their credit, NASA and the European Space Agency are taking the first steps toward a permanent lunar infrastructure, at least as regards time. It seems an odd thing to be concerned about, but with GPS and similar systems now controlling most of our lives, it stands to reason that such systems will one day migrate to the moon. GPS requires timing accuracy of 10 nanoseconds for a 4 meter precision. At that speed, the relativistic warping of spacetime becomes noticeable, and all GPS satellites operate on a system called terrestrial time that is calibrated for relativistic effects. In 2024, the International Astronomical Union took a break from not naming new dwarf planets and declared the need for a lunar celestial reference system, governed by a separate lunar coordinate time. The reference system, they declared, should be analogous to the Earth-based geocentric celestial reference system, already used to track satellites in orbit, and be consistent with the standard Earth second. One possibility is to create a similar system to that employed on Earth to scale time for GPS satellites. On Earth, time for GPS satellites runs about 38 microseconds per day faster than time on the surface. On the moon, thanks to a combination of the moon's lower gravity and the combined motion of both it and Earth, a clock on the lunar surface and one in orbit would differ by 56 microseconds a day. The difference is wide enough to invalidate coordination between moon and Earth-based telescopes. The problem with resolving it is that the moon has no single datum, or substitute sea level, to define its surface. Different missions have used different values. However, in 2001, 
The Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter established a new datum for Mars, roughly equivalent to its mean equatorial radius. So perhaps a similar definition could be applied to the Moon. Much like the clippers of the 18th century, travelers to the Moon have tended to employ the time at home, either universal coordinated time, the successor to Greenwich Mean Time, or the respective local times in Houston, Beijing, or Darmstadt when conducting missions. As coordination increases, however, this will no longer suffice. Some form of local lunar time will be required. Given the Moon's slow rotation, time zones on the Moon last a full Earth day, so time differences will never be more than an hour. That said, those considering such things tend to agree that any future selenites would employ universal coordinated time as standard. Should one be required, however, the Moon provides a very convenient prime meridian. Since it always faces the Earth, just slice the near side in half. And this month, a team at the Royal Observatory in Belgium concluded, after considering several increasingly convoluted options, that the simplest answer to the problem is probably the best. Just use whatever lunar time we ultimately come up with and steer it, much like we steer atomic clocks today, to account for time dilation. There are many things to consider regarding our future on the moon. Who will want to go? What societies will they form? And most importantly, what will they do when they get there? But at least, when they do, they can be secure in the knowledge that, should these steps be taken, they will know exactly where and when they are.